agenda. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today at our second annual ICRC and Me event. This is becoming a holiday event for us, and we're really excited to have you. I'm Patty Reyes. I'm the ITRC director, and I want to welcome you to this webinar today. Our agenda includes giving you a brief overview of who ITRC is, and then a summary of all of our ITRC teams, those that are finishing up their products this uh, in the next few months, those that are starting new in 2022, as well as a quick reminder of all the teams that will be continuing their work throughout 2022. Next slide. So we are a brief introduction to our ITRC um, products um, and who we are. Again, ITRC is the nonprofit research arm of the Environmental Council of the States or ECOS, and we represent all states and territories and are located in Washington, DC. We are a state-led organization composed of members from state agencies, the federal government, the private sector, academia, tribes, and community stakeholders. ITRC members participate in technical teams and produce tools, resources, training courses, and guidance on environmental technologies and innovative approaches. Next slide, please. Who are we? Well, our membership, as you can see, is currently over 1,300 participants as shown in that uh, breakdown of the pie chart. But the benefits, the real benefits of ITRC are that we share best practices that often result in decreased costs and time for state regulations. We leverage our partnerships, we increase our efficiencies, specifically right now in renewable efficiencies, and we foster a network for um, industry leaders and regulators to work together, to communicate, we're truly a unique catalyst for a dialogue between these individual groups. Next slide, please. This slide um, just lists all the teams that we'll be covering today. And before I turn it over um, to the first two uh, team leaders that will speak um, about the products that they have completed this year or are completing in the next um, few months, um, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us. Um, we are going to allow questions throughout. We're going to stop for a quick Q&A, but you can put your questions in the chat at any time, and we will uh, refer to the team leaders, um, for those to the team leaders. So at this time, I want to introduce the two teams that are finishing up. First is Becky Stanton from California's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And Becky is the current team leader for the strategies for preventing and managing harmful cyanobacteria benthic team. Uh, Becky, yeah, that's a mouthful, but please take it away and thanks for joining us. Great. Good morning, all. And um, I again want to welcome you on behalf of myself, my co-team leader, Ben Holcomb from Utah, and our program advisor, Sherry Basinger. And i um, happy to share our team website there. I think the link will sh show up in the chat shortly. And um, we'll go on to the next slide. So we started out with a um, cyanobacteria um, team last year and covered primarily planktonic or water column cyanobacteria. And why we developed a proposal and have been working on a team for benthic is that it's quite unique for certain aspects of its ecology and life cycle. It'll grow as mats attached to bottom surfaces, either the rocks or cobble or sediment along the bottom or other plants, um, uh, debris or vegetation. Um, as it grows, pieces can get attached and then float to the surface. And then as water moves and they float along, they can also strand along shorelines where there might be a higher risk of exposure to humans or animals. Um, because of this life history, it can occur in clear water and in areas with higher flow, either lakes, reservoirs, streams, or rivers. Um, and while it's growing along the bottom, it might be less visible and can also co-occur with non-toxic filamentous green algae. So the environmental conditions in which it can grow um, affects this differently. And there can be human and animal impacts and particularly documented dog dust when the mats are either contacted or ingestion. And they do tend to um, more commonly produce neurotoxins such as anatoxin A or saxotoxin. Next slide. So the team um, that's been going on again for since uh, January of, of 2021 um, developed a lot of information that's helpful on the ecology and life cycle. And again, why these are different. 
um, we've developed a more uh, robust uh, section on cyanobacterial toxins that can be produced by both cyanobacteria um, that grow as benthic or as planktonic. We've also revised the information on the monitoring and management strategy tools. We've revised the management strategy cheat sheets to incorporate um, what we know about benthic as well as the existing information for planktonic. And again, we consolidated information in the visual guide so that it's all in one place for these different types of cyanobacteria. And those will all uh, go live uh, next spring. Next slide, please. Another uh, great product that has come out recently is a video um, and some of the captures are along the bottom um, with our experts. And, and that's to assist water body managers and identify these different types of cyanobacteria um, as far as uh, the genus, um, what toxins they can produce, what they look like um, visually as you walk up to a water body, as well as what they would look like under a microscope. There's also some field tests, um, such as the jar and stick tests that help identify um, whether or not it's a non-cyanobacteria um, feature of the water or it's actually a cyanobacteria bloom, um, as well as other things such as water fern or duckweed that might look like cyanobacteria from a distance but can be identified uh, closer up or microscopically. So it's a great resource and we really welcome um, everyone taking a look at that. Next slide, please. So again, for our uh, benthic cyanobacteria team, we have developed a, a companion guidance document that'll be live on the web um, this coming spring, so spring of 2022. And we are also beginning development of training uh, modules that will go along with that and will be advertised the same way. Uh, hopefully some of you participated in the December 2nd training for the original HCB team. Um, and we look to expand on that knowledge base and um, build on that for the benthic cyanobacteria. And again, that'll uh, coincide with uh, the guidance document coming out next spring. Uh, next slide. So any questions? Um, um, Patty or other people from the ITRC team? Don't see any in the chat yet, but please, for those folks that just joined us, uh, please feel free to put a question in the chat and uh, we I will moderate it and we have a few minutes for questions. Um, yeah, I think one just came in. Do all cyanobacteria blooms produce toxins? Um, and that is uh, uh, a false. Um, no, they don't all, um, but we have to identify what taxa are present. And then you can't visually tell if, if they are producing toxins because even if they have the potential, they may not be expressing those genes at any one given time. So it does take a little bit of work. And we always recommend that if they have the potential to produce toxins, you would assume they could be toxic until we know otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Becky? How about, can you tell if a bloom is producing toxins by just looking at it? No, it doesn't change in appearance. Um, there's no uh, visual cue of whether or not there's toxins present. So again, we have to take a sample and send it to lab or use a field strip to qualitatively assess whether or not there's toxins. Thank you. Any other questions for Becky? This is such a hot topic. I know that uh, I keep getting emails from my community talking about the lake that I live near with uh, shutting down for the toxins. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, so that uh, save time and move on. We did allow up to five minutes for each speaker, but uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Becky. Our next speaker is Claudio Sarantino and Claudio works for the California Department of Toxic Substance Control Agency. And he's one of our team leaders for the soil background and risk assessment team. Claudio, take it away. Thanks, Patty, and good, hello, everybody. Uh, our team developed a comprehensive guidance on how to establish a new- Claudio, you're school. breaking up. We can't hear you. Our team developed a comprehensive guidance on how to establish and use soil background in risk assessment. We started in January 2020, and the final version of the document 
will be available before the end of this month on the ITRC website. Bonnie, Brooks and I are the team co-leaders. Bonnie actually represented two states. She started working with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and along the way, she moved to the Washington Department of Ecology. Program advisor are Jim Rocco and Leslie Hay Wilson from Sage Risk. Next, please. Here, you can have a glance of the composition of the two team and the balance between private sector members and regulators and academics. We had about 120 regulators on the team, 90 from agencies from 37 states plus the, the District of Columbia, 30 from seven different uh, federal agencies, including EPA, DOD, DOE, and uh, USGS, for example. The, we had uh, um, private sector members, uh, about 120 of them uh, from 58 different companies. So as you can see, there is a reasonably balanced split between private and public sector that ensure that all voices were represented and heard. Next, please. Here you have a list of uh, some of the topics covered, uh, and I want to highlight, uh, for example, in section two, we uh, described the uh, definitions of a natural and anthropogenic background, as well as what is the fault and site-specific background. Another section, for example, covers uh, how to carry out background studies and what you can do with existing data if you, when you have them in terms of calculating background values. Also, we cover uh, using geochemical evaluation and environmental forensic as additional lines of evidence that can help uh, figuring out what is background and how to determine that. Next slide, please. Here are some more of the sections of the uh, guidance. Uh, there is the uh, section on statistics. And if you are a statistic uber geek, you'll be disappointed. This is not a, a, you know, a manual of statistics. But if you are a user like myself, you'll find this discussion useful to understand what a statistical projects are available to establish background and how to make choices among them. In section 12, we provide a regulatory framework that is based on a survey sent to all member states and uh, presents uh, what each state is doing in terms of definition of uh, having default background values and what guidance documents are uh, uh, available. Then we had some case studies that to exemplify in a very practical manner what they, uh, we present in the guidance as content. And also we have flowcharts that they, uh, you know, show the whole flow of the decision making process and how the various elements get together. Next slide, please. We are still working on developing four training videos. Uh, one is going to be an overview of the uh, guidance in general, and we'll present also some the content of the other two, the three uh, videos. Uh, the video two will prevent, uh, present, talk about sampling and analytical methods. Uh, video three will talk about establishing uh, and using soil background in the risk assessment. And uh, video four will present uh, uh, information about geochemical evaluation and environmental forensic and how they can be used to evaluate background and fold that into the risk assessment. The, uh, these videos uh, were probably going to be done uh, early next year, probably at, towards the end of February. There will also be a, a webinar in which we'll play the uh, pre-recorded videos, but there will be also a live Q&A with the experts from the team that will be available to respond to any of questions from the audience. Last slide, please. And as mentioned earlier, again, our documents should be done in a few days uh, and be available on the ITRC website and the training videos uh, should be available in early 2022. Thank you. If you have questions. Thank you, Claudio. For those attendees that just joined us, feel free to put any questions in the chat. I do see one. Um, Claudio, can you speak a little bit about the geochemical evaluation and environmental forensic role in establishing background risk? Yes, these are, uh, you know, relatively uh, recent techniques that uh, 
provide additional line of evidence uh, go, the, to go beyond uh, just a, a straightforward statistics that have been used in the past. Uh, and uh, again, these are fairly sophisticated analysis uh, and uh, uh, people with uh, expertise in the area, they should be uh, performing those analysis. It's not you know, run of the mill, but uh, project manager risk assessors should be aware of what they are, how to interpret them then, and what kind of question to ask when they, they are presented with this kind of information and what information they can provide as well. So uh, the uh, geochemical analysis is more for inorganics like metals, arsenic or lead. The environmental forensic is more, for example, for PFAS uh, or uh, PAHs or PCBs. Uh, these are other organic chemicals that often contaminate uh, uh, cleanup sites. Great. Thanks, Claudio. Very informative. And uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention you're the first team in the history of ITRC to completely finish up without having met in person due to COVID. And hopefully the last. Yes, hopefully the <laughs> Absolutely. We are planning to make sure that it's without <laughs> any control over COVID, make it the last team that uh, doesn't have a chance to meet. The, um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat. Are there any other questions? Anybody have any questions? We will give folks uh, a few minutes at the very end. Uh, if you think of a question uh, during during uh, the rest of this seminar webinar, uh, feel free to send the questions then. Um, but if there aren't any, I'm going to pass the baton over to our ITRC co-chair, Randy Chapman from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, who's going to introduce our new 22, 2022 teams. Thanks, Randy. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, and welcome everybody and glad you could uh, be on the call. Um, yes, I'm not introducing 22 new teams. I'm, I'm talking about the ITRC 2022 um, uh, new project teams. And uh, the registration in, uh, is open for these teams. Uh, we'll, uh, the teams will start in January. And as Patty mentioned at the very beginning and Claudio uh, discussed during his um, a couple of his slides, you can see that there's a makeup of a variety of people on these teams. So even if you're not in particularly in that area of the new teams, if you know somebody in your program or somebody in your agency and somebody in your group, we are looking for everybody from different facets, um, regulatory industry, stakeholders, everybody we can to be part of those groups. Because it's very important that we have a broad spectrum of, of input and insight. So uh, certainly uh, we encourage you to, uh, to sign up for the teams or talk about it to other people and introduce them. There's the ITRC webpage you can go to to get it for more information. And if you have any other questions, uh, uh, that uh, certainly put them in the chat box and we can, after the introduction of the five teams here, we can um, uh, answer those questions or uh, send them to the ITRC uh, group and we can, you know, for later on and further discussion. But we really encourage you uh, to, uh, to sign up for these teams or if you know somebody, uh, tell them about these things. All right. So the first team that I'm going to introduce um, is uh, kind of an update. It's a existing team, the PFOS, and uh, we're fortunate that everybody for the new teams we've had, we've asked each team to uh, have a team leader, one of the people the team leads, to, uh, to discuss their project. Uh, and the first one will be the PFAS update from by uh, Sandra Goodrow uh, from the uh, state of New Jersey. Sandra, it's all yours. Thank you, Randy. Um, yes, I'm Sandra Goodrow. I'm a research scientist with the New Jersey DEP. I co-lead the PFOS team with Kate Emma Slosher of New Hampshire, and we have amazing program advisors, Leslie Hay Wilson and Jim Rocco, just really top-notch program advisors. We're very lucky to have them. Um, at the top of the slide there, you can see that we do have an existing team website. Um, we have a guidance document up that was originally published in April of 2020, and we have since been working on some updates. Um, and we have a set of uh, team fact sheets on PFAS that cover different topic areas. Um, so as I said, we started in 2017. Um, we put out the guidance document in April of 2020. And this year we've been working on updates. So in July, we added a new surface water quality section. And um, in December, we have a whole bunch of new updates, which I'll go over on the next slide, or at least I'll give you a taste of them. There's a lot of them. Um, we also continually uh, continue to regularly update the PFAS water and soil values table, which is 
um, a collection of regulatory values from around the states and other countries that can be very useful um, to site managers and other state individuals that are concerned uh, with PFAS contamination. Um, and we're doing a lot of training and outreach opportunities. Next slide. So this slide gives you an idea of some of what we've been working on um, that we're going to complete and have as part of the tech reg updates uh, this December, yeah. so any day now. <laughs> um, we've updated the references across the document. And then in 10 sections, um, we've identified where the information um, is expanding, that we're getting more in the literature or more at the state level, and that we need to expand uh, the content that we've put into the tech reg. So for instance, in a few sections, such as the firefighting foam and the site characterization section, we've We've added a discussion on source identification or what some people like to call forensics uh, to really kind of understand where that PFAS contaminated, uh, contamination originated from in what you're seeing and the results of your environmental media today. Um, we have updates in the sampling and analysis section, which are extensive because there's a lot going on with getting good, reliable um, sampling and analysis. So that's really going to be um, cutting edge when we do, when we finally publish this and lots of other good information on treatment technologies and such. So um, in, uh, in just the next uh, few weeks, we'll make sure and, and have that updated. Next slide. Um, we're also uh, expanding our training products. Uh, you can visit our training page. The um, link is up there. Uh, we have several um, PFAS topic videos uh, that can cover topics such as fate and transport, um, site characterization, nomenclature, and we have four roundtable expert Q&As. That's a real interesting uh, training concept. We brought together some of our um, top experts on PFAS in different uh, areas, and we took questions from the participants, and it really turned into a very unique format that we recorded, and we provide a written digest. So those four roundtables are available on, or, or at least the early roundtables are available, and we're working on getting the later ones posted. So that's our training page. Um, and we also like to partner with multiple course trainings across the country before COVID, we would uh, travel and have our authors and uh, the team members as part of the trainers. Um, and we've been doing a lot of video training in the past year or so. Next slide. So moving forward into 2022 to 2023, um, we've still got a lot to do because the science is really moving. Um, our team members are going to be collecting, evaluating um, the distribution of the emerging science. Uh, so for instance, we're exploring the newly identified PFAS, uh, expanding the understanding of current topics and addressing recently identified concerns. Uh, we're looking to uh, update the guidance document further. Uh, estimated to be around June 2023. We're going to update the video and in-person training content um, and come up with uh, short fact sheets of new case studies. Um, we're kind of working on the content of those. All these ideas are provided by our members um, in meetings that we've had, uh, such as the fall virtual meeting, we had breakout rooms to really discuss what questions we haven't answered yet in the guidance document and where we need to go and to collect the data. So there's some great discussions going on. They're certainly not um, done yet because this new team, this new side of the team starts in January. So uh, we're looking for members to participate. Um, you know, we have some great people already, but, um, you know, we're always looking for some fresh eyes to look at the information. So um, on the right side of the screen, you see some of the topics that we cover in the PFAS document. Um, so there's a lot to do moving forward. Uh, is there another slide? Or nope, I'm going to send it off and uh, send it over to uh, the sediment cap update. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am Wes Thomas. I'm an engineer and, and project manager with Oregon DEQ and representing the sediment cap update team today. I also wanted to introduce my co-lead, uh, Richard Doucette, who is currently a regional land protection program manager at Virginia DEQ. 
We're really excited to have Richard. And I wanted to acknowledge our two program advisors, Sunal Patil and Hilda Fade, both engineers with Arcadis. Uh, and really, I just want to say today that we are expecting to get up and running in early 2022. Uh, and, and we are seeking some well-rounded team members with representation from state and federal agencies, as well as academia and industry, uh, really to come together and build a guidance that's going to be uh, useful and serve the needs of both state agencies uh, and practitioners. So really, we just want to echo what Randy said at the, at the very beginning here. Uh, and then you can see there's a link to our team website here. So please do, if you're interested in this topic, uh, click that link and join our team. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the sediment capping guidance will be an update to the 2014 ITRC contaminated sediment remediation uh, guidance document, which provides really a holistic overview of sediment remediation concepts and does include some discussion about capping we envision that this update to that 2014 guidance uh, will incorporate some improved understanding of cat materials and amendments and how they perform, some advanced understanding of fate and transport mechanisms uh, that are important to consider during design, uh, and then really incorporating some refined sediment uh, sampling techniques and pore water sampling techniques and modeling tools with the goal of making these techniques and tools more approachable uh, and user-friendly. A couple other key objectives for the new guidance. Uh, one is really to compile and update information into one comprehensive guidance documents. There's a, a lot out yes. there that does speak to uh, uh, sediment capping, and we really want to have all of that information available in one place. Uh, we want to facilitate a greater consistency and efficiency in completing cap designs. And, and by you know, part of that is going to include hopefully finding ways to standardize some performance expectations while also balancing and acknowledging the need for flexibility when it comes to cap design. And then ultimately try to incorporate sustainability concepts uh, into uh, cap design approach. Um, as with many of these, these guidance, uh, we envision that we will include, the guidance will include a web-based uh, document that would, and that we would also host online training to help roll out the guidance. Um, so that's all I have. I will turn it over to the managed aquifer recharge team. Next slide. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelsey Bufford. And as of yesterday, I am the new Superfund program manager for the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality. I have the pleasure of being one of the co-team leaders for the managed aquifer recharge team. Joining me as the other co-team leader is Dusty Early, who is the Utah Underground Injection Control Program Coordinator for the Utah Division of Water Quality. Our program advisors are Jim Rocco and Leslie Hay Wilson. Next slide, please. Aquifer recharge is a growing practice in response to water scarcity concerns and remedial driven withdrawals. However, there is a lack of consistency in how these practices are described, implemented, and managed. The Managed Aquifer Recharge Team, or MAR for short, seeks to better define and standardize the range of active aquifer recharge actions and develop best practices for recharge options and modeling applications. Augmenting groundwater storage through managed recharge and aquifers represents a cost-effective way of increasing the availability of source water. With that being said, there is a need to examine and standardize innovative recharge infrastructure, excuse me, that could be utilized for MAR and to define the appropriate geologic settings and tools needed for characterization and design. Our team will evaluate the potential uses of managed aquifer recharge, the factors for the safe and successful implementation, innovative characterization, and modeling tools that can be used to appropriately place MAR infrastructure. Our project deliverables will include technical guidance documents, including case studies, fact sheets, online training and tools, as well as reference sites used for monitoring, 
groundwater quality, subsurface geologic characterization, and modeling. Next slide, please. Next, we will discuss framework for chemicals of emerging concern. Hi everyone, my name is Vivek Mathrani. I'm a toxicologist and human health risk assessor with the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. I'll be co-leading the framework for chemicals of emerging concern team along with Paula Panzino, who is the chief science officer for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Maggie Mandel is an environmental engineer with Environmental Works and she will serve as our program advisor. So what motivates the formation of the team are two major issues. Um, one, that chemicals of emerging concern often demand immediate response by state regulatory agencies and require a clear procedure on how to identify, evaluate, and manage them. There's also need for clear guidance or consensus on how states should evaluate and manage chemicals of emerging concern. Too often, we're in a holding pattern on what position we should take for addressing a chemical in the environment, or we are uh, looking across the aisle at another agency who is an early adopter on taking a position with them. So coming together as a team, we're hoping to create a framework for anticipating responding to these chemicals and possibly building upon the lessons learned from uh, PFAS's perfluoroalkylated substances, along with other chemicals such as 1,4-dioxane, to develop some sort of proactive approach to identifying future chemicals of emerging concern and remedial uh, strategies for them. Next slide, please. So what we hope to do, the end game for the team by December 2023 is to generate a series of fact sheets. Uh, there are three principal fact sheets that we anticipate um, drafting. Uh, one is uh, how to address how states can track and identify chemicals of emerging concern to better manage them. Another would be identifying the properties and traits that lead to identification. And the third would be providing guidance for evaluating these properties. Already we've uh, garnered about 70 members uh, who have registered for the team and the count keeps growing day by day. We welcome a diverse set of perspectives and backgrounds. I myself am a toxicologist and human health risk assessor. So you might imagine that exposure and toxicity might factor into my prioritization scheme for identifying chemicals, but we wanna invite other perspectives as well. So uh, during the q and I'm happy to answer questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to the ethylene oxide team. Thank you for that. Hi, I'm April Lazaro, and I'm with the State of Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy Air Quality Division. And I will be joining efforts with Keisha Long, who is with South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, and she's the Environmental Justice Coordinator there. Our program advisor for the ethylene oxide group is Kristen Perry. And one of the, the things uh, that I find great about this group is that ITRC is really broadening our horizons uh, with this one into the foray of air quality and this uh, issue of ethylene oxide. We've got a few points we want to expand on and um, broaden um, our educational materials on. And I want to point out at the beginning that while we have some basic um, ideas for how we plan to proceed, we'd like to say that this is an it is a flammable colorless gas and it's used to make a variety of chemicals. And it also plays an important role in the sterilization of medical devices, as well as spices. And so the emissions from ethylene oxide can um, come from these point source emissions. There's also some non-point source emissions out there that are causing um, some background efforts for emissions that are hard to define. And so we want to try and establish a consensus on how best to measure and analyze ethylene oxide in the environment. And then one of the things we'll do with that information is to improve our efforts to better manage and effectively communicate risk 
to communities that are living near ethylene oxide emitting facilities. Next slide, please. So some of the products that we plan to evaluate and produce as a part of this work group includes fact sheets and informational videos that we're famous for. Uh, one of those, we hope to try to differentiate um, the other studies and better understand impact of ethylene oxide on the communities. We want to try to evaluate possible ways to differentiate between point and non-point source emissions. We're hoping to pinpoint the identification of appropriate sampling methods that can be used to measure ethylene oxide accurately in the environment. And then we'll put together some information on tips for sources on how they might reduce ethylene oxide um, from their operations. And again, like other teams that are new, we're really seeking to gather some additional input from you who might be listening, those that you know that might be interested. We really have some East Coast uh, participation. We've got some West Coast participation. We've also got participation from a variety of folks within the US EPA. And so we're looking to gather additional information from those of you who might be interested in joining. You can always reach out to us if you do have any questions about what the team might look like and how you might bring your game to the table and help us out. So please feel free to reach out to any of the three of us and we'll get you on the team. All right, uh, thank you, April, um, and everyone else who uh, talked about the new teams. I um, just wanna add on to what April just said, and I will say this from experience. Uh, being on one of these teams, folks, if you have not been on a team yet, you're, um, you're gonna be exposed to people and get to interact with people that you never thought you might normally would in your day-to-day -day work. So you know, not just joining a technical team, but the other people that you guys are gonna meet, that you're gonna have interactions with, it, it, it's really um, professionally fulfilling, um, it's really interesting, and I, I really encourage you to think of it also from that way. It's not just the technical, hey, it's work, it's got to slog through it, but the uh, opportunity to meet people that you probably would never meet um, you know, in, in another normal situation. So again, uh, thank you, April, and everybody else, uh, the team leads who uh, discussed the new oncoming teams. I hope uh, you guys are interested in, in signing up. Again, if you may not be interested, please uh, recommend to any of your folks that you work with uh, if you think they might have an interest and pass this along. Now, the um, I don't see any uh, questions except for one um, that was um, sent into the chat room. It was basically uh, started with the PFAS, but so we're gonna just jump back to the soil real quick just to cover it. Um, the question was, uh, the, do you see um, the depositional uh, method um, have an effect on uh, the, the way they evaluate soil contamination? Now, Bonnie Brooks, uh, Claudio's co-chair, a uh, co-team lead, uh, answered that question. But uh, basically, Claudio, if you're there, or Bonnie, if you want to chime in and just kind of summarize how you answered it. But basically, does the depositional environment, hope I'm not messing this up too much, affect how you evaluate the soil contamination? Yeah, no, I don't maybe. know, Claudio, if you wanted to take that, um, this is Bonnie. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. So how I answered that is we don't really get into that amount of detail. Um, we do get into a difference between defining natural and anthropogenic ambient background, knowing that each agency is going to define that a little bit different, but we had to come up with a definition for our guidance. And so we just, we don't get into that much detail, but we do provide that definition and then also um, we really just, we get into how to establish background, how to use it in risk assessment, and that's not gonna be really different. Like the statistics aren't gonna be different, but the thing that might differ a little bit would be the geochemical evaluations, as Claudio said earlier, that's really used for inorganics. And then also the environmental forensics, which is gonna be used for organics. And usually our organics is gonna be our anthropogenic ambient and our inorganics are going to usually not always be our natural. So we don't really get into deposition or anything that really reaches that level um, in the actual guidance. But the, the closest thing to it would be 
those different definitions and then how you actually incorporate that into establishing it or using it or deciding what to include and what not to include. I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, let me know. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Bonnie. Uh, and again, anybody who um, you know you have questions, uh, please, please um, uh, send them in, and, and we can answer them at a later date. Uh, I have been uh, asked to move this along, so I'm going to move to the the next speaker, uh, my uh, co co chair uh, with the ITRC board, uh, Keisha Long, out of uh, South Carolina DHEC. Uh, she's going to be talking about the continuing teams. So it's all yours, Keisha. All right. Thank you, Randy. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm excited to highlight our five teams that will continue working through 2022. These teams are open now for new team members. So I hope you see a team that you would like to join or meets your interests. Next slide, please. The first team I would like to highlight is the QUEST team. QUEST stands for Quickening Environmental Solutions and Training. In 2022, this team will focus on the development of a knowledge map. And the knowledge map is a roadmap to information contained in ITRC's current and past fact sheets, documents, trainings, and various products that we've produced over the past 25 years. The knowledge map will be a framework that outlines where users can access information on environmental remediation topics within ITRC documents. For example, uh, the knowledge map will provide a comprehensive list of documents or trainings that cover conceptual site model development or risk assessment or what have you. As the team develops the knowledge map, they will highlight if there are any gaps or if there are concepts that would benefit from a summary sheet or added context. And in these situations, the Quest team will look to develop one page concept, summary sheets, fact sheets, or short videos. Please consider joining this team or sending information about the team to your colleagues. The team leaders are John McVeigh from South Dakota and Thomas Wallace from Mississippi. And the program advisor is Matt Plackey. Next, please. Next is the Pump and Treat Optimization Team. They are scheduled to have a first draft of their guidance document for internal review in March of 2022. Uh, this will align with their first in-person team meeting, knock on wood, in late March. The team is working on in 2022 on writing and organizing the content as well as identifying resources and graphics for the guidance document. External review of the first draft is planned to take place in the fall of 2022 but there's still time to join the team and help shape the final team products. And as you can see on the screen, Janet Waldron with Massachusetts and Michael Sexton with Virginia are the team leaders. And Evan Madden with ECOS is their program advisor. So please consider joining the puppetry optimization team for 2020, 2022. Next, we have microplastics. The microplastics team completed an internal review of the guidance document first draft in October of 2021. The team is looking forward to additional reference material that is expected to be published in early 2022. So this will shape their next draft of the guidance document. The team is on track to conduct an external review in late spring 2022 with the final document expected in late 2022 or early 2023. Additionally, during the March annual meeting, the team will start to sketch out their training opportunities and formats. So there's definitely time to join the team to help shape the final team products. And maybe you could become a trainer the team leaders are, oh, could you go back, 
quickly. The team leaders are Valerie Hanley with California and Kim Nimmer in North Carolina. And Sherry Basinger is the program advisor. Okay, next please. Environmental data management best practices. We all have to deal with data and we can get a lot of data and maybe be overwhelmed by it. So the EDM team will start their 2022 year by pulling together draft information in preparation for internal team review in late January. And that will go through February. In March, the team will be getting together to review edits from the internal review, as well as start the development of the training options. The external review of the document will be out in April 2022. There are opportunities to shape the presentation of all the products throughout 2022, as well as be a reviewer. Uh, we have internal review within ITRC, but also external review that we appreciate any comments or questions that we get for those who will be using these different products. Our team leaders are Douglas Morrison with New York and Brian Pointer, also in North Carolina. And the program advisor is Steve Browner with Environmental Works. Next, please. Hydrocarbons. The hydrocarbons team will continue to work on a high level overview videos and training frameworks in 2022. The team continues to work on multiple scenarios that will help draw together the LNAPL, TPH and PVI issues for the training. And ITRC has documents currently on all of these issues. This will be a, a comprehensive review and uh, notation of all of these documents and trainings. The team hopes to have draft training scenarios and opportunities available in late spring of 2022. If you would like to join the hydrocarbons team, there are opportunities for the first dry run presentation of training courses in summer 2022. So as you, can, you can help shape the actual training of these products and team leaders Tom Fox with Colorado and Richard Spies out of Vermont. And Jeffrey Kuhn is the program advisor. And with that, I believe that's my last slide. And please put your questions in the chat and we will answer them as we see them. Oh, sorry. I am seeing. Patty, are you still there? Yes. Sorry, we can hold you. My Patty gets back online. I uh, see from Doreen Peters. Will emerging contaminants include all media, air, water, soil, sediment, biota? <laughs> And then Paula, you did type in the chat. Would you like to verbally answer the question? Yeah, sure. So um, hello, everyone. I'm a co-team leader for CEC. Uh, and what I put in the chat is pretty much what I think we're going to be determining is uh, gathering up our team and taking a look at what the scope of uh, these fact sheets will be and what will be included in the effort. Uh, I do believe that we will be working toward understanding how to prioritize and determine what a CEC is. And um, in doing so, we'll be looking at exposure pathways, which will cover all of the media that Bonnie um, mentions in her comment. Okay, thank you so much, Paula. As you can see in the chat, there's a link to register for all ITRC's active teams. I encourage you to please check it out. Thank you. And I would like to hand it back to Patty for the wrap up. Thank you. 
wow, we're 10 minutes early and I lost my bet. I thought we were gonna go well over the hour, but um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. I know it was a valuable uh, time that uh, you spent with us today. And I hope it was uh, clear that we want you to join ITRC. If you're not already a member, we want to see you on uh, these new teams and the current uh, the continuing teams in 2022. And uh, again, we have our website there where you can contact us if you have any uh, follow-up questions. All of our contact information is located on that website. And for more information, uh, as well as the, uh, on the individual teams can be found on that website. But um, if I don't see any other questions, um, and uh, we- There is actually one other, and it's a very good question from Karen. Uh, she asks, uh, when you request to join a team on the ITRC website, what does the process look like for acceptance? And what is the usual time commitment for being a part of the group? Okay, so it's a slightly different uh, time frame if you are an industry member, because your company has to join the industry membership first, and then you can join any team. But for all others, it's uh, very quick. You go up, you sign in. Um, and within typically 24 to 48 hours, the team leaders and the program advisors for those teams will accept you and you'll receive a, a welcoming letter from ITRC that you're on that team. Uh, but you need to first join if you're an industry member, the company needs to join. You can join as many teams as you'd like. The time commitment is going to vary depending on the team, the life cycle of the team, where they're at, and your availability uh, to participate. So everybody's a volunteer. And we understand that sometimes people are much busier, um, you know, during field season uh, than other times of the year. So I would say we're always pushed on this, that it's um, anywhere between one and 10% of your time. We do have two meetings a year for each team uh, that are uh, in person. And we're hoping to be uh, in Salt Lake City for the annual meeting, um, the end of March of this year. And then in the fall, the teams will also be meeting. They also meet once a month, typically 60 to 90 minutes uh, on a Zoom call to uh, determine their next steps. So that's the time commitment, but it really is up to you. I also wanted to say um, that if you did not see a topic that's of great interest to you today that we're not working on, we do start the whole proposal process in the spring, uh, the prior year. And we would love to see as many proposals as possible from anybody on any, to any environmental topic. We will then go back to the states and uh, see how, that, how important that topic is to the state regulators. And then we go through a full ranking process with all of our board members that represent the feds, industry, states, and tribal um, stakeholders. So, um, so those are the ones that select the team topics but they come, they start with proposals in the spring from anybody. Are there any other questions? I just wanna add on to what Patty said about time commitment as a state employee and recognizing that everybody has their own skill sets, right? We're not all researchers, we're not all technical writers. And it's the same thing with the teams. We need people for various different roles. Maybe you can, you can be part of a subgroup that maybe you're helping with the writing, maybe you're helping with the researching, Maybe you're helping with the editing and at different, like Patty said, during the life cycle of the team, there's different way how we're focusing on it. Does it flow correctly? Does it read correctly? Does it, you know, how does it look uh, grammatically? Uh, does, is it simple enough in language or too complex? Or you're adding things from your own experience. So there's different roles for different people. But certainly, as, as Patty said, it is what time you can put into it and is available and whatever fits your skill set. So we actively we encourage you to be involved regardless of what uh, particular, um, you know, maybe not this team is your first team and maybe it's, you're not really great at it, but at the second team, you're more comfortable and whatever you can do, but certainly be involved. Um, mm -hmm. And there's different things that we need people to do during the life cycle of the team. So uh, please, you know, sign up. And if there are no other comments or questions, I think we will end the Zoom. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Devin has put up on the screen all of our uh, social media links. They're all active there 
for more information and of course our ITRC, our, our new website this year. And um, we hope to see you in 2022 and thanks for joining. Bye-bye.